kind of an interesting synchronicity this morning that got me thinking. Um, I got a lot of inspiration from a brief note that was sent to me by Nicole Tailfeathers uh, regarding the behavior of some some a uh, African elephants, I believe it was. Um, some of their violent violent uh, reactions to things and how uh, some of the scientists working with them were proposing that um, these elephants were behaving like this uh, because they had something akin to like post-traumatic stress disorder um, that derived from you know previous encounters with humans and basically being traumatized um, so that got my wheels turning and then and then I saw uh, this other uh, little photo come across on my on my Facebook uh, news feed and it had a northern flicker that had um, you know attached itself uh, to a boat that was about 20 miles offshore and um, it was uh, basically uh, hitching a ride on this boat. Um, and this is, I thought, a really cool example of synanthropic behavior, which is another way of saying this is how animals are responding to and what we're doing. See, we don't live in these isolated niches where humans are doing one thing and animals are doing another. It's all systemic, except that us humans, we are, um, we are the maybe the one species who isn't really interested in responding to anybody else. Um, not really. I mean, we do, we do give it a little token of response here and there when things get really critical, say a species gets right to the edge of extinction or something like that, um, or, or is extremely threatened, then we might make some moves to respond to the situation. But otherwise, our basic approach has been get the fuck out of our way. And, um, and if you too stupid to get out of our way, we'll kill you. And we might just kill you anyway. I mean, this is, this is the way that we are, unfortunately. Um, it's not by nature, it's by culture. Because it, it hasn't always been this way, but this is the, um, you know, the mainstream um, approach, is we've got a world to build, and we've got all the all the rights in the world to uh, to build that, and so it doesn't matter if there's a good habitat here for whoever, they can go somewhere else. We're gonna plow this up, and they better move out of the way, or they're gonna get plowed up with it. Um, anyway, I'm starting to rant. This is gonna be a rant anyway some respects, but I'm starting to go off course, I think. So, what what all of this this morning really got me to thinking about was the trauma um, that was being put on animals. And, I, you know, it's interesting that, that we, like everything else, we're in, our, in this mainstream culture, um, we're very human-centric and very concerned about ourselves and our stuff. And so we pay, we do pay some attention to um, to human traumas and to you know psychological, social um, illnesses derived from those traumas. We pay some attention to it. It's it's still pretty like tokenish, but um, but at least there is some attention and. But there's very, very little that's given to animals, and I think that uh, this case with the elephants is just one in one in millions of, of uh, cases where animal species have been traumatized.
traumatized by us to the extent that we have uh, completely changed their behavior. I mean, I know this to be a fact because, um, say for instance, in Lewis and Clark's journals, when they were coming across North America, they got to the plains, the magpies would come into their tents and eat from their hands. Now, that really says something to me about what the relationship was like between, you know, indigenous peoples here and those birds. Uh, because that's not the relationship between humans and birds here today. In fact, if you even look at a magpie out the side of your eye, he's going to fly away. And the magpie is not even as, um, as skittish as the crow. And you know that crows have been um, pretty much in the mainstream. They're used as a symbol of evil and death and this kind of a thing. When you watch a movie when something evil is coming, you'll start hearing the crow calls and this kind of a thing. Um, crows have been totally vilified in the mainstream, just as wolves had and you know, other animals um, arbitrarily. And so, um, so many people hated crows for so long and were free to, uh, to kill them, not to eat, but just to kill, just because crows were bad. Um, that the crow has become extremely, extremely skittish uh, of people. So I live myself with magpies and crows, and I've got a crow that I've that we've had from a fledgling, and I, I've had a magpie that we've had since almost fledgling. And the behavioral difference is extreme. The crow is very much more afraid of humans than the magpies. And the same with the wild uh, magpies and crows. You know, once I prove myself to the wild magpies, um, I was able to feed them by hand. They do land on me in this kind of a thing. Um, as long as they know that I'm not like the others. But the crows will never trust me. No matter how much work I put into it, the crows are not going to trust me. And you know, I think this comes from a history of uh, a recent history of human beings here abusing the crows, um, traumatizing the crows. Uh, you look at the way that coyotes behave. If a coyote knows that you're looking at it, it turns tail and runs. You know, to me, that's that's a sign that. Um, clearly made these animals feel as though they are in danger being around us, and they are. They are in danger being around us. If a coyote decided that um, humans were good and it was not going to be afraid of coyotes I, or humans, I don't think that that coyote would last long. I think it would come, you know, be within sight of the wrong person soon enough and somebody would shoot it um, do something like that so you know we have been traumatizing the animals one thing that I that really made an impression on me this last summer is um, you know, my colleague and, and in-law uh, Narciss and I took our students down to Yellowstone Park where there are um, a lot of animals where, you know, when we pulled in and we were setting up our tent, there was a fox sitting right there watching us set up our tent. Um, where you see herds of buffalo uh, in, the, in the fields, and, and, or in the pastures, or uh, what do we call it, meadows. Um, as you're driving along through the park where you see um, elk, where you see wolves, bears, 
you know, all of these animals that are that are pretty rare, pretty rare in, to see in North America. Um, but Yellowstone Park is a volcanic caldera. It is an active volcano. And that is, you know, the extent of how bad it's become for the animals that all of these, all of these, you know, species have had to flee to the caldera of an active volcano as the only safe place <laughs> to live in at the present. And that's a sad, sad thing. Um, and so what do we do about it? You know, Nicole told me she still, she prays to the animals every day. She prays for them. You know, I think that's good. But I don't think that's enough. It's like Atsimoyaskan without Atsimskasin is not complete. And when I'm talking about Atsimskasin, I'm not just thinking about going out and, and leaving a, an offering. I'm thinking about what you can actually do to amend the relationships that we have with animals. You can go out and leave them a pinch of tobacco, which they got no use for. Um, or you can bring them some food. Or you can look at uh, ways to, to help build, um, or not, not necessarily build, but uh, replenish habitats that they need to survive, that they need to thrive. Um, we can let them really coexist with us, you know, quit. Every time, you know, an animal, a so-called wild animal, um, is, makes its presence known in somebody's house, it's time to wipe them out in this culture. That, that's no good. You know, you find a spider, you smash it. You know that there's a mouse, you trap it, poison it. You know, the coyotes are coming around, it's time to shoot them. Somebody finds a rattlesnake in their yard, they call me and I come pick them up. You know, why can't we coexist with the animals? We throw away all this food, vegetable food, meat. You know, we've got all of this food, we eat at dinner, and we've always got some something that we didn't eat and we throw it away. Why can't we give that to the animals? You know, what about our bodies? How come we put our bodies in these uh, when we when we when we die we put our bodies in these crypts or we burn the energy away and incinerate ourselves? Why do we do that? Why can't we give our bodies back to the source? Um, why do we have to take their lives so lightly? We're going to develop over here. So we're just going to wipe this stuff off of here. And all the animals who are living here better get a move on. Yeah, that's, that's no way to be. Because, as I pointed out at the beginning, we're not, we're not isolates. And there's so much evidence for that, it's ridiculous, everybody knows it. And yet we continue living as though we're isolates, we can do whatever we want to do, and the animals, all the rest of creation is going to do what it's going to do, but we're going to carry on with our whatever regardless, with no kind of interest in 
having our behaviors seriously informed by the ecological realities. So I think making those kind of really fundamental and important changes where we start responding to the other animals and to the, and to the realities of what's going on in our environments and our ecologies, that's the kind of stuff that is going to comprise real Sim Scots. That's the kind of stuff where we're going to be actually putting our prayers into action instead of just talking. What are we doing to make them become the reality? And that's the question that needs to be posed. That's the question that everybody needs to consider for themselves. You know, Speaking it is important, but it's, you know, it's supposed to also um, be balanced out with, with active behavioral changes, and that's what, that's the part that we're lacking. So yeah, so the animals are, have been wickedly traumatized. It's probably going to take some hundreds of years now to turn that around if we're all on board to do that. And if not, you know, like, like I can't control everybody, so I do my thing. And the animals know me, they know who I am, they know what I'm about, and I have some trust that other people don't have the animals who know me and to me you know at least I feel like I'm doing my thing I am I am uh, contributing I am making my amends in the ways that I can make it and I'm not just talking I'm doing I engage with the animals every single day live, one-on-one, face-to-face. So, those are my thoughts this morning. It's something to be considered. And I'm always looking for the synanthropic behavior. I'm always looking for the ways that the animals are adapting to us. I think uh, after this morning's insights, I'm also going to be paying a little bit more attention to, you know, Some of the ways that maybe animals are displaying um, are displaying the the effects of that history of trauma, because I think that's an important story to tell too. So thanks, Nicole, for the inspiration, and uh, hopefully we can make a difference.